And the good news is, in the old building, we were already in the basement. <laughs> so it was not a problem. We could just stay where we were, and the tornadoes came and went, and it didn't matter. We were there all day long. But um, welcome to New York. It's great to have you here, and it's great to have Purdue and Craner with such great representation here in New York. Um, it is the East Coast. There's a lot going on here. And um, I'm, I've always been proud to say I was from Purdue and Craner. And people around the world absolutely know Purdue. There is no question. Um, and they don't know what an MSIA is. Um, I love the idea of re possibly rebranding that, although I've spent now 30, almost 40 years explaining it, so I'm pretty good at it. But nonetheless, um, that's, that's just the reality of it. So when I was asked to talk to you tonight, I have to say I was, well, how about some direction? What should I talk about? Whatever you want. Is there anything harder to do than talk about whatever you want? Um, and, I, and I have to admit, I, I thought through a range of, of issues and alternatives and so forth. But I don't know about you, as, as long ago as my academic career was, I still have this bit of an academic cycle. So the fall is still clean notebooks. Now, of course, no one uses notebooks anymore, but I still see clean pages. And I still think of it as an opportunity to do maybe better than I did last year, but to think about it differently. So I started going through my, my thought process around what could I talk about, and I decided to talk about some fundamentals. Not the, this is a football fundamental, but the fundamentals of running a business and how to think about business in a way that I was hoping might be of value and interest to all of you, because in truth, if you have a framework and you have a fundamental approach, you're so much more prepared to deal with whatever situations might come along and to handle them in a way that can be very successful and, and very effective. And my, my view is that, in truth, the failures that we've experienced, um, particularly in the financial services industry, which I'm painfully aware of, and I've spent my full career in, um, and, and just the general you know, process that's gone on over the last few years, from my perspective, has been the failure of fundamentals to really help make decisions and to keep people doing the things that work best and that they should, should focus on. So when I think about it, and I'm very, I, keep, I like to keep things simple, I like to keep things kind of visual as well, to me, it's the four-legged stool. And a four-legged stool generally is something that's actually quite secure. You would be willing to step up on that four-legged stool and reach up to something high because it's sound. It has four good legs on it. And to me, each leg is an element that needs to be considered all the time, every day, part of life when you're running a business. Shareholders and investors, you may or may not be public, so you may have shareholders, but we all have investors. It could be yourself as the investor if you're running your own business. Customers and clients, employees, and community. There are a lot of other different ways to think about it, but here's one specific framework that I have used when I ran a small business or medium-sized business, <coughs> and frankly, when I was running the global consumer business, which was a very large business with 200,000 employees in 35 countries, and okay, it's city, and we made $11 billion in my business those years, but that was in 2004, 2005. I just want to make sure everyone knows that's when I left. Um, <laughs> what happened, happened, and, and there you go. But in those days, you could have to point to these fundamentals, and you could pretty much ask anybody in the room. And they would do that. And I would also tell you that one of the things I did, and I was never mean about putting people on the spot, but I would ask people, and I would give them three minutes to write their business, um, to, to put down on a piece of paper what their business model was. Because if they couldn't do it, they didn't have one. And if they couldn't articulate it, they couldn't execute it. And that fundamental structure is something that's always driven the way I approach things. So shareholders, of course, are the ones who've given you the capital and the wherewithal to run your business. You could not be in business without them. And they have the right, and appropriately so, to expect good results and good returns. 
you're nothing without your clients. It's your reason to exist. If you don't have clients and customers, you might as well stay home and think other kinds of thoughts. Because without them, there's nothing to do. Employees are, in fact, the way you get things done. Without them, there's no possibility of delivering and fulfilling the promises and expectations you have. And of course, the communities in which we live and work are way broader now than we used to think about them. A community used to be a physical space, kind of around the plant or the place you work. Community now is global, and in fact, it's not necessarily physical. Communities are digital, they're online, they're very broad. But the community has a huge impact on how successful a business can be, how it's perceived and what might happen. <laughs> Disregard for any of these significant issues really can create a negative, negative situation. And think about it as what happens if you take away one of the legs of the stool. Do you still want to stand on it? Do you still want to build your business upon it? Obviously, the answer is no to that. So executing fundamentals has always been a bit of a challenge. It's not sexy, it's not exciting. Sometimes when you talk to people, oh, I don't want to talk about that. Well, you know, if you can't get the fundamentals right, I can almost guarantee you're not going to get the rest right either. And you're not going to be able to do it in a successful way to continue to build and grow for the future. So clearly, and I don't want anyone to think I'm, I'm minimizing the challenges and so forth, there's lots of stuff that has to rest on the stool. And I would describe those things in core competencies about the way you run your business and who you are and how you approach it. And there's a whole range of things from financial disciplines and transparency and risk management and innovation and lots of things that sit on that stool. But if they're not sitting on a four-legged stool, they're sliding off the stool. So no matter what you think your competency might be, you won't have a foundation to execute. So to me, Failure to focus on these things is really what creates the upheaval. And I would argue that the problems that we've seen over the last several years, kind of building up to the financial, well, crisis is another word to use for it, I'll call it that, the financial crisis, is really an important element. So let's talk about how these things kind of work. So shareholders and investors, there's no question. Shareholders expect, deserve appropriately a return and good results and good profits. And that's appropriate. And they've provided capital. I've always thought it's the need for additional capital, which there always is in built businesses that you're trying to grow, is what creates behavior. And sometimes that behavior may not be so good because one view of it, of course, is you get more if you do well. So how do you do well? Well, that, of course, that depends on people's views. So some investors like very short-term results. Give it to me now, and don't worry about the future. Well, that can be done, and then there won't be a future. But that, that certainly can be done. So that behavior that manifests itself and how you prepare to get additional capital and how you deal with your investors has a long way to go in terms of whether or not you have a future successful business and one that you can be proud of. So what's a good job is always a question that has to be answered. And I would argue that when you get into a give it to me now, give it to me quickly, give it to me on a transaction basis, which is, again, what you would, we could say, quite honestly, was leading up to the financial crisis, is not the best model or sustainable and appropriate kind of view of, of growth and, and the future. So let's talk about mortgage-backed securities for the moment. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's not evil. It's not bad. Derivatives are not evil and bad. Mortgage-backed securities, in fact, reduce the cost of mortgages to people and, in fact, created accessibility. You would want that every day. In the days when a mortgage meant when you said the word, you thought of two things. You thought of homeowners, now there's a concept, and you thought about a balance sheet. And you thought about how that business was done. And there were limitations, real genuine limitations. Great financial product and innovation created opportunities to expand and grow. That would be great. But in the process of trying to behave in a way that investors wanted certain kinds of results, 
I'd say it just got totally, completely out of control and out of hand. And you took something that could have been a good thing, and was for a while, and turned it into the beginning of something that was absolutely devastating. So that's a behavior. There's a whole other talk that I could give, and others can give, on the safeguards that should have been in place to prevent that from happening. That is, in fact, a full conversation. We'll put that to the side. Another issue. So has anyone ever said or heard, this would be a great business if it weren't for my customers and my employees? <laughs> <laughs> Some of us have heard that. Some people have thought it. It's a wake-up sign if it ever comes to your mind that something is terribly wrong. Because without our customers, of course, there should be no business. There would be no business. And if, in fact, you're having that kind of situation, there's something wrong. There's a problem that needs to be dealt with. And you need to better understand what your customers and clients need and want and how you need to deliver it. So the three boards I'm on are, to me, interesting, particularly on this issue, because there's a range in the way the customer is viewed. I mean, you can't pick up any piece of information from virtually any company and not tell you how customer-centric they are. Everybody's customer-centric. Just ask the customer. And they might have a different view of what that means. <laughs> so some of it is rhetoric and some of it is real. One of my, my boards, and I'll say, you know, this, this is all public information, Accenture, is in fact amongst the most client-focused organization I've ever seen in my life. It's all about the client, all the time, every discussion, whether it's a budget discussion or a quality discussion, any discussion comes back to how does that impact the client. Is that good for the client? Does it help us do a better job? Not can we get more clients by doing them, because you can get more clients if you do a good job with your clients. It's just totally embedded, has been for a long time. Another board that I'm on, and I'm actually the non-executive chair of the Gannett Company, so I've been getting a lot more involved, which is kind of fun for me, I'm kind of that hands-on uh, view of things. So we're in the media business, and the biggest part of the earnings of this company had come from the newspaper business, which had a business model that was about print, it was about subscription, and it was about, about advertising. So how many people today bought a newspaper? Well, I have one delivered. I still like the paper. How many people, however, know the news of the day? Right. The good news here is that people are more engaged in news than <coughs> ever before. That's fabulous. But this is a company that, in fact, waited a bit too long to make the moves to say what we have is news, which is fabulous, and we have it you know, quality, and it's local, and What's the, the Lafayette paper is one of ours. Uh, I get that one online, by the way, <laughs> so I can keep up. Um, so this is a company that would, would honestly say, you know what, we kind of forgot who our customer was, and we kind of forgot what was going on. We thought the product was so critical to everyone who would kind of always be there. And it is, and it will be just in a different form of delivery mechanism. So we waited a bit longer than we should, working like crazy now to get there. I actually think because we also paid attention to another basic, which is a good balance sheet, we have the opportunity to do what needs to be done. But there's another example. And my third board is one that got, you know, that did all the things that all the mortgage companies did. And, and they forgot there was actually a human being attached to a mortgage that lived in a house. <laughs> and as a result of that, you know, there are important things that have to be taken account of. And that just got lost in the entire industry. Um, and, you know, the result of that is something you all know and you read about on a regular basis. I only hope and pray that none of you have, and you and your families, have had to go through the horrible, horrible situations that resulted because of that. So, the customer. I have a view that the critical way of knowing that, in fact, you're customer-focused is having respect for your customer. It's not necessarily about the data, which is great to have and essential. It's not about the product features and so forth. If you have respect for your customer, you're going to be customer-focused and do a great job. 
and employees. So let's say we don't have that day where it would be great except for my employees because they're making me crazy. The truth is, your employees are the best leverage you have to ever make your company great and to grow. And the day you lose sight of that is the day it all starts to get off track. Because while it may be the largest line item of expense to be managed appropriately and to be looked at carefully for productivity and effectiveness and all of those things, that is the place where innovation will come from. Because your employees will know and the day that gets out of line is because you ask them to do things that are out of whack between what you want them to do and what the values are or what they thought they were. And the biggest problem you have around that is employees actually knowing you've asked me to do something that's wrong for the business, wrong for the, the customer, and now what do I do? No good comes of that. And that's a good example of exactly what happened in the financial crisis. And no amount of incentive, except maybe in a particular line of business and financial services, will allow people to keep doing the wrong thing on, a, on an everyday basis. But for the most part, people won't do it. They don't come to work in the morning to do a bad job, and they don't come to work in the morning to not take care of the customer, and they don't come to work in the morning to be unclear about what it is that needs to be done. And the last issue that I would address on that is, is the community. And the community, that ecosystem that we live in, that, you know, again, might be the physical aspect of the community outside, or it might be, well, not, I shouldn't say it might be, it is, in fact, global. There is, there's virtually no business that isn't, isn't in some way a global business. And that's, you know, a great strength and a great opportunity, and one that has to be understood and thought through from, a, from the community standpoint in terms of how, how you run your business. At the end of the day, investors have an opinion about what a company does with respect to the world around them. It could be as simple as being green inside, but it can be way more complex in terms of how you treat others outside. And it can be the community that's formed digitally, which if you get on the wrong side of, is almost instantaneous horror show and very challenging to repair. Um, so recognizing the world in which we do business is essential. And again, I would argue that in the buildup to the crisis, people just didn't care. They didn't care about the communities. They didn't care about what's going on. And they lost sight of all of those things that actually provide the foundation from which you can really run a business successfully, I believe, and for the long term. term. So I think what I'm saying, amongst other things, is that having a framework is absolutely essential. You could argue you could have a five-legged stool, you could have a three-legged stool, you could have any number of legs on it you want, or whatever picture you want. But if you don't have it, how do you communicate to people what it is? And if you have to wake up in the morning and say, I'm starting over, I'm starting from scratch, hmm, I wonder what the business model is, hmm, I wonder what's important. Imagine what happens when you have several employees, or 200,000 employees, who show up in the morning and don't know what's important. And regardless of what their job is, they're making decisions all day long all day long, even when you think, oh, these are not just decision makers, they're just answering the phones and talking to a customer. Oh, that's a pretty big decision, isn't it? How they say it, what they say, no matter how many times you, you've told them what to say, it's not the script, it's the tone, it's how they feel, it's all of those issues. So the framework, to me, is really what allows the opportunity to run your business successfully, to communicate it properly to really build the kinds of things you want to do. But one issue about the framework that I would like to bring up, and, and for those of you who are not from Craner, um, that some of this might not apply. Um, I'm thrilled that this is a Purdue meeting group, but I actually didn't know that, so I apologize in advance. But when you talk about framework, I, and then again, I, it was a long time ago that I was there, but I understand some things do carry through. 
like strategic and tactical views of a problem. Does that ring a bell to anyone? A case, a discussion? Actually, when I say anyone brings up this uh, case method, I still get nauseous thinking about <laughs> the cards we used to, you know, get in the old world. It was all paper. Um, index cards with our names on it. And somebody, you know, and the professor would pull out the card with your name, and that was what I called the human sacrifice of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and as long as, you know, as soon as your name wasn't called, it was like, oh, thank God, I can breathe for one more day. But nonetheless, um, that whole process um, really made, for me, and I think for many others, a big difference. So we had the strategic and tactical view of the problem, the comprehensive compilation of facts. What are the facts? How many times would we be asked that? What are the facts? Where are the facts? How do you know, How do you know that? Those were questions that for my career, were essential every single day in the way I looked at things. A clear, comprehensive plan of action that could be articulated, measured, and reviewed in terms of did it get done and was it successful. So I would argue that the values we learned and the experiences we had were pretty important in terms of how we view things and how we do things. And you may not even know you're doing it. You may not even realize it. That's the good news of fundamentals that get embedded into the way you approach it. We learned hard work. We learned how to work in a team and as a team. I was an MSIA, so I say hard work twice. We learned how to work all day long, all night long, and get up and do it again the next day. And that was a critical issue um, in terms of how you approach life going forward. But we also learned how to communicate because sometimes your name got called. And communicating clearly and communicating comprehensively was absolutely fundamental. I could not stand up and talk in front of people before I came, you know, before a friend. There's just no, I couldn't do it. I couldn't face it, couldn't do it. I came out of there saying, fine, what do you want me to talk about? You know, I can do this because I have a framework in which to do it. So wherever you are in your career, however you're thinking about life or work or whatever business you're building and so forth, the one thing I would encourage you to do is something that has always worked for me, and that's to be able to, I used to say put on a piece of paper, obviously no one does that anymore, but to be able to articulate clearly what your framework is, how you make decisions, how do you know what's right and wrong, consistently, every day. If something's important, you know, it's not just important today, it's important tomorrow. I used to describe it as do the right thing every day, you know, all the time, every time, um, because it doesn't shift, it doesn't change. And think about how you do run your business in, in, in those terms, and I, I think it will harken back to the disciplines you learned and the incredible foundation um, that we all received uh, when we were in West Lafayette, at, at Purdue, and specifically at Craner, that I think really allows for the future that the Dean has described. There is no question that what you have, we have all received, is, is in truth a blessing and a foundation that will carry us forward. And I'm thrilled to see that you know, successive generations um, have these opportunities at Craner and, and will have them in the future. So with that, I would be happy, I know we've run late, um, but I'd uh, be happy to answer 